Hello everyone, I am architect Parul Kumta and I have been involved with the universal design movement for over three decades. Uh, in fact, right from my uh, college days when my research dissertation was also to do with uh, a form of uh, universal design. Uh, I am not just a teacher, a pedagogue in this subject. I, I have also extensively executed interventions as well as executed fresh designs, new designs of my own, which are based on universal design principles. Uh, this is something that I believe is a requirement and something that needs to be done at all times. Uh, it is not something that should be an add-on. It is something that should be the very basic uh, stay right from the beginning when we start uh, working on any form of architecture. Uh, I am also a TED speaker. You can, if you search for my name, you will get my TED talk and also a published author in of many books, one of which is dedicated to universal design, which I shall be telling you about at the end of my talk. Uh, and my contact details will also be available in case you want to know more. Uh, with this, I will start. Okay, um, one important thing that I forgot to say is I'm very closely associated with the uh, disability rights movement as one of the co-founders of a support group called Forum for Autism. And I have worked very closely with self-advocates uh, who are uh, persons with disability themselves on various projects that they have uh, heralded and they have led. So, uh, and have also been a part of the revision of the Rights of uh, uh, Persons with Disabilities Act and part of the team that worked on the guidelines for accessibility. So with that, I will start sharing my screen. And give you a small glimpse of some of my works. So as we all know, and many of you have even done the course uh, with ethos on universal design. Uh, when we talk of universal design, we are talking of equal and easy access. But more importantly, it is equal and easy access which gives dignity. And to do that, what we do at my firm and what I do as a designer is to explore not just the principles of the design, but look at adaptive and assistive technologies and uh, look at how barrier-free uh, situations can be worked out for various kinds of uh, situations, not necessarily only disability. So it could also have to do with cultural differences. It could have to do with uh, invisible disabilities. It could have to do with old age situations like pregnancy, uh, illiteracy, which would not, uh, which would be a barrier in uh, being able to read signages, et cetera. So as I see it, the aim of inclusive design is to design so that we can make, uh, you know, we can give dignity to all people, as many of, the civiliz of civilization as possible, and make people feel valued, respected, honored, and seen so that they can lead their best lives. Now, what are the obstacles that come in the way for this? Basically, we often do not have insight into the challenges and the lives that are led by persons who come from various different diversities, uh, whether they be disability or any other. And often as designers, as architects, we have been trained to focus on aesthetics. So it needs to be a very conscious shift from looking at only aesthetics uh, towards looking at how what we put forth as design impacts on society. I live by this axiom uh, by the architect and writer John Carey, uh, which basically dignity is to design what justice is to law and health is to medicine. So essentially it means that there's no point in designing if you're not designing for dignity. Just as there's no point in uh, practicing law if you're not practicing to provide justice, or your, uh, there's no point in practicing medicine if you're not doing it to create health. So the uh, 
various areas through which universal design impacts on civilization and on people and their lives and the dignity with which they can live it is through basically these various uh, forms of architecture and planning, uh, education, commercial, recreational, transport related, public utilities, and of course, residential. As we all know, there are various guidelines laid down for accessibility. Uh, many of us are very conversant with them. We also have the harmonized guidelines adapted, adopted by the Ministry of uh, Social Empowerment and Justice, the Department of Disabilities, and uh, many of us even follow those. The things that don't get mentioned in many guidelines, including the ones that we follow, is how to adapt to various sociocultural situations. For example, uh, in most of the cities of India, it's not wheelchairs that are used, but three-wheeled uh, cycles. And we do not have guidelines addressing the needs of those. So we have to be conscious about that. Similarly, local languages, India is a country of many, many, many rich languages and cultures. And we have to be very aware of that when we are designing, say, signages. Uh, similarly, we can have city-specific requirements. In a lot of small towns, two-wheelers are the primary way of going from place to place. And this can be actually a deterrent when uh, you know, we create uh, situations like uh, providing ramps everywhere. They often do get uh, used by uh, two-wheelers, creating, in fact, a hazardous situation. So being aware of that and trying to work around it so that uh, two-wheelers are all not inconvenienced at the same time, persons who require the ramps can use them conveniently and safely. Other things that need to be looked at and very often guidelines that we use do not address these needs is the dimensions of the average people of India when you're designing within the country. Also, the economic uh, viabilities of the materials that we use, the kind of uh, construction means that we use. For example, there was a project I did in Chhattisgarh in some of the tribal villages. And there was no point in giving uh, stainless steel bars over there for grab bars. So we had to look at what were, would be more conversant for them to use, what could be more local, and also look at construction uh, methods, which would be easy for people of the area to construct. It should not be that we come in from the outside, do something and move away. Also pay attention to the psyche of the users when you're designing for accessibility. So with that, I want to go on to look at various, like I'm trying, just trying to give you one example of uh, each of the uh, types, typologies that uh, I have addressed over the last three plus decades, starting with educational. This is Government Girls School in Nashik. It's a heritage structure. It's a heritage institution. Uh, it's uh, been in... Uh, functional for over 100 years. Uh, and uh, many of the well-known persons, uh, women of Maharashtra have been educated in government girls school. Uh, this is the layout that existed uh, before we gave our interventions. And you can see here that there is no clear distinction between the pedestrianized areas and the areas which are used by vehicles. They're just roads. You know, it's it's something that has just grown uh, uh, very uh, organically. So sometimes when we look at universal design, what we really need to look at is how is the space and how could we better address it to make it safer for the users? Now, in this case, the school users. Also to look at things like how do these people come to the school? How do the girls come there? And we realize that many of them get off at the bus stops on the pavements outside the school. Many of them come by three wheelers, auto rickshaws to the space. So to make it accessible from that point onwards. And of course, then look at the structure within the school. So the first thing we did was segregate the areas that were accessed by vehicles 
and the areas that would be pedestrian so that those areas are demarcated completely separately and the children can play safely, right? Of course, we provided ramps. We indicated that there could be a lift, pneumatic lift in place, uh, you know, tactile warnings, etc. cetera, uh, making sure that we can give access to two-wheelers while keeping two, access to wheelchairs while keeping two-wheelers off. And you can see that we've also addressed uh, accessibility uh, requirements on the pavement abutting the institution. Next, we're looking at uh, an example of commercial uh, uh, a commercial project that was undertaken by us, which was basically the Big Bazaar franchisee. Now, as we know, uh, of course, Big Bazaar uh, is not functional anymore, but they had branches all across India. And uh, it's a franchisee, so anybody can start it in any space. So the challenge we had was to see how we can have guidelines in place which are specific to the uses and functions and the needs of a space like Big Bazaar and ensuring that these can be replicated no matter where the space is, right? This is a, a, a space that was taken up in Nagpur. So we are looking at that and, you know, making sure not just uh, that the whole processes of billing, the processes of selection, the processes of trial, and all of that were made accessible, but also looking at what the footfall of such a place would be. How would it be possible to safely evacuate people from this space in case of an emergency, right? Uh, another important thing that need to, needed to be in place, especially when you're looking at uh, uh, franchisees or corporates or any such thing, is that they have very specific brand colors. And we have to work with those brand colors when we are looking at uh, creating signages, creating even tactile markings, or creating any of the uh, spaces, you know, uh, that need to be uh, put in as interventions. Because we cannot be uh, in contrast to the brand colors. So that was a really very big uh, uh, kind of restriction that we faced, a challenge, you would say, and we have to work with that. Also, you have to remember that all their rooms, their trial rooms, their toilets, everything are very, you know, they have the same lot of contractors in a franchisee that go from space to space for any of these brands, right? Or you'll have one big contractor and many of his teams working on it. So the interventions have to be easily replicable. So these were the challenges we worked with. Next, going on to recreational spaces. One lovely space that we had the benefit of auditing for universal design and accessibility was the National Gallery of Modern Art in Mumbai. And uh, this is, in fact, an extremely lovely example of good practices of universal design because the space was not really designed to be an a art gallery. It was uh, the Kama Hall. It was a hall attached to the Royal Institute of Sciences, and it was just a meeting space for lectures and such. Uh, however, uh, a designer, much before we came in as auditors to it, has used that shell in such a beautiful way and refurbished the whole thing, uh, keeping, uh, being very cognizant of its heritage status, ensuring that the shell, the heritage shell is not destroyed, and ensuring that all the needs of a modern art gallery are uh, put in place. However, they had a lot of challenges to do with accessibility. And of course, the thing we have to always look at is not just to be able to go into the space and come out of the space, but this is a space where you should be able to enjoy art, to be able to uh, kind of dialogue with the art. So uh, we had to look at how that would be possible for persons from all uh, diversities and in persons with disability. So these were the challenges that we faced here and, uh, you know, interventions were uh, uh, put in for uh, keeping these in mind. Transportation is another very important aspect of accessibility and universal design. 
uh, one of the things that is often said when people speak about the need to create accessible spaces is, uh, you know, having people say, but how many persons with disabilities do you really see in public spaces? And one of the reasons you don't see them is because it's very difficult to move around in public spaces. Therefore, transportation becomes an extremely important part of uh, universal design and accessibility interventions. Here again, I'm sharing with you uh, the central bus stand uh, project that we did an audit for, which is situated in Nashik. You can see the bus movements that are happening on screen. Essentially, it was a very chaotic, again, largely ergonomically developed space. And one of the things we had to do right away was segregate the various ways in which the circulation of buses happened. Earlier, buses were just coming in and going out of the same gate, making it actually, and, and people also got in and out of the same space. So firstly, separating the pedestrian uh, entry exit points from the vehicular entry exit points, then uh, separating the entry points for the vehicles from the exit points, separating the different areas for the buses. There were some buses that went locally, that moved locally. There were others that moved interstate. So we had to even look at that. And then, of course, use the guidelines to make all the spaces accessible. Use your tactile markings, use your ramps with the proper gradients, uh, have your signages put in properly, uh, you know, and various other things that uh, will be available in the harmonized guidelines. You also have to, when you're, when you're working with spaces like this, which are large, which have a very high footfall, and which already have a large number of structures in place, right? Like your bus stands, uh, there was a mall built there, and there were many other such things. You have to be aware that you cannot just suggest that it become a clean slate. You work with what is available and work around it and work with it. So this was the challenge here. And, you know, these were things that we put in place with our design interventions. Now, pu public utilities uh, is also something that often gets brushed under the carpet. Things like, uh, you know, payments, uh, things like uh, road crossings. And one very, very important public utility, which is so closely connected to dignity and being able to function at, as your best person, is uh, good toilet facilities. Um, as a woman, I know how difficult it is, especially in a profession like ours, to move around, you know, to have site visits in areas where toilet facilities may not be available, or if they're available, may not be accessible may not be clean, may not be uh, having running water. There's so many such aspects right, connected to it. So I'm now sharing this really small project that came to us. It was, uh, we were approached by an NGO that works with uh, rural schools in Maharashtra. And they called us essentially to upgrade the absolutely broken and run down toilet to this. Uh, Taluka school that was uh, there in this region in one village. Now, uh, we could have just retiled it, put new faucets and fittings and, uh, you know, took our, taken our fees and moved on. But because we come from the mindset of universal design, we thought of looking at it and seeing what are the issues that are faced in this toilet? Why does it come to this situation? And as we know, this is no unique situation. Most rural school toilets uh, are found in such situations, absolutely unusable, filthy, with no running water because there is water scarcity. And very often, because it is so unusable inside, the outside walls of the toilet get used for toileting purposes, at least by the boys, right? Uh, girls must suffer... Uh, a lot of, you know, health problems because of not being able to use toilets properly. You will see, I want to draw your attention here to this toilet block at the top, which was in a top left, which was in a relatively good condition because it was a staff toilet. It had running water. It was clean. 
uh, all the fittings were functioning and it was locked. So we kept that in mind too when we designed. So what we started off doing was looking at how do we design the lobby area firstly for safety and for accessibility. Now we said that there has to be an accessible toilet and there wasn't one when we went then. And of course, we were told that, you know, there aren't any persons who need to use an accessible toilet to which we had our counter argument saying that maybe they're not there because you don't have one. But we had to keep this in mind. And I'll tell you how we address that as we go ahead. So you can see the front wall of the lobby area is made of brick jali to give transparency. And the reason for that was very simple. We wanted to encourage a habit that already existed that after school hours, the villagers use that toilet. And therefore, we wanted to ensure that there was transparency leading to security. You know, the eyes on the street. The next thing was fitting in our accessible toilet, right? So accessible, uh, let me just put all this here so I can explain this uh, in a better way with all of it in place. Yeah. So now look at this. This is the plan of how the toilet was. We had a ramp coming up and straight into the accessible toilet. No turns, uh, no complicated maneuvers, right? It went straight in. You can see that the accessible toilet is on the girl's side of the toilet block, right? So you have the cubicles for the girls and the wash basins. The boy's side had one cubicle, several urinals, wash basin, right? Now, because there is a lack of water, what we had put in place was a flushing system, which was in series. So that at the end of every break and at the end of school hours, somebody who was responsible came from the school and did a single flush from the lobby, right? So that minimal amount of water could be used to flush down the toilets. Because where there is a, a lack of water supply, people don't have the habit of flushing when they are just using it for urination, right? And that leads to filth in itself. So this took care of that. The other thing we did was you can see that there are two separate cubicles, one within the girl's side and another within the boy's side. And these are the staff toilets. So these staff toilets are still separate. They are not within the student areas. They can, just as they are today, be locked, right? So that they're used only by the staff. And because they are within the spaces used by the students, it will again mean better security and it will mean authoritative eyes on that space. So in case something is broken, something is not clean enough, it comes to the notice of the staff. The other thing we did was to provide the accessible toilet in, uh, in such a way that it doubles up as the second lady staff toilet because it's on the lady's side. Uh, this is because, as we know, in most schools, uh, you have more female teachers than male teachers. And the other thing is that because it keeps getting used, it will not break down, not become a go down, a storage as is generally the case with most accessible toilets. So that was the other reason we had put it on this side. Uh, next, what we did, was that we got rid of windows altogether because we also had to make it uh, economically viable. So the space had no windows, but because it was in an area with heavy rainfall, we had a sloping roof. And beyond a certain height of wall, we had put uh, provided a, a wire mesh. So that kept the airflow and ventilation going through, right? The cost of providing it was much less. And it also allowed sunlight to come in. So we have the advantage of using the natural sterilization methods of uh, high, good sunlight to penetrate into the deepest corners of the toilet space 
to ensure that it is stench free, it is not wet, and it is well ventilated. The other thing we suggested was to make the walls, external walls of the toilet, mural walls for the primary school children, uh, which would be a natural way of discouraging the uh, villagers from, you know, uh, using those walls uh, for, uh, you know, uh, toileting purposes and basically defacing them because it will be their children and their art which will be up. This was quite a successful design. And in fact, after this was done, the NGO decided to replicate it in a hundred other schools. Coming to the residential, uh, this thing, uh, this is a, a bungalow that we had built for Arvind Prabhu, who is a quadriplegic uh, businessman, very successful businessman. Uh, this is in Karzat. And he had a lot of specifications in place. He wanted a space. Uh, he wanted bedrooms from which he could see the sunrise as well as the sunset. This is on top of a hillock. Uh, he wanted a big open space where he could uh, he's very fond of uh, uh, rock concerts and he wanted to have the provision for that. He wanted the entire space to be accessible and he wanted to be able to have a view of the lake from his bedroom. So all of these things had to be put in place. He also wanted to be able to give out this bungalow to uh, weekenders, uh, you know, when, they are, when the family is not using it. So he wanted to be able to house uh, maybe two different families in the two bedrooms and also have the living space, the living room space, double up as a dormitory. And then on other times, he also wanted the living room space to double up as a uh, theater, mini theater. So you can see there were a lot of overlapping things, but the most important thing is all of this had to be accessible. Right, So this was a lovely challenge. We really enjoyed doing it and also adding a lot of aesthetic elements to it. It is a one of its kind. It has also won some prizes for engineering, etc. And, uh, you know, uh, it was just wonderful uh, to work with Arvind and, uh, you know, look at his, uh, cater to his insights and his passions. We are associated with a lot of NGOs. Some of these uh, are listed here. Also a lot of government organizations, a lot of non-government organizations, private organizations, educational institutions. And, uh, you know, these would be persons uh, who have even been our advisors in many spaces. Uh, this was just a very small glimpse because there is really no way in which I can encapsulate more than three decades of work into this short time. But we do have uh, this book that I told you about earlier. Uh, it is based on the work we did in Nashik. And one of the important aspects that is covered in this book is how do you look at heritage and religious spaces for accessibility? Because very often you do not touch uh, as designers, you do not touch areas which have this kind of gravity of uh, use, you know, in terms of uh, both heritage as well as uh, rel religiosity. Uh, one of the important spaces that we looked at in Nashik was the Ramkum, which is extremely important for practicing Hindus of this area. It's the place where the Asti Visarjan is done. And so every family is closely connected to that. And then also Trimbakeshwar, which is one of the Jyotirling areas. So all of the details of this and how you approach universal design and accessibility, not necessarily only from the guidelines point of view, uh, but you know, in all the ways that I spoke about uh, through my projects just now, uh, has been outlined in this. You are free to reach out and uh, place an order for this uh, at this email ID and uh, you know we can see how it can be made available to you. Also feel free to contact me uh, you know if you feel 